curious, what is that actually? What is what is? Pipe yeah. cleaners? Pipe cleaners. Pipe cleaners. I don't think that's the term either. anymore. I think they're called chenille something or other. I mean, are these like, is not are these actually functional, functional yeah. or they're just descriptive of what, what do they actually do? Well, they, 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 were, they, they were meant to clean pipes, but okay. since we're not supposed to be smoking anymore. Okay. Oh, um, the smoking pipe. The smoking pipe. Huh. Okay, I'm going to just uh, be very informal because this is really an impromptu kind of uh, you know, subject that um, was actually suggested by Kirk Waller. I blame him for it because I wanted a more academic title, you know, academic sounding title. But that's just because I'm very interested in the subject of education and the, um, the fact that if you want to work in the space industry or space programs or be a space uh, enthusiast or be a uh, you know affiliate of somebody who's working in the space program. You need to have a lot of knowledge before you can actually contribute to that. It's very nice to look up in the sky every day and say, "Oh my goodness, the stars are up there," and astronomy is that you know a very uh, interesting topic. But ultimately, when you want to uh, transition from being just an enthusiast to being somebody who wants to contribute and who has to contribute because they feel it inside themselves, then there's a realization, I'm sure, with all of us that you need to learn a lot more. And I'd like to just take the opportunity uh, to uh, kind of get uh, perhaps a discussion thread going um, on uh, what the uh, assembly here uh, thinks about what drove them to, you know, uh, what actually happened in their own lives or careers uh, that they would uh, that they were considered important enough that actually gave them the chance to be a you know, vital member of the uh, space community. But if we were to look from our experience vantage point, because we're all older, and look at the younger generation coming up, what would it take for them to be motivated enough uh, so that they would consider following in our path? But if they would like to consider, it's a two-step process. First, they would have to be convinced of the need or innate need to, um, you know, select uh, a path. I want to work in the, you know, space industry. What would they need to do, and Sorry. how would they be able to get that support from their community, their parents, their teachers, uh, their, uh, you know, their future goals? I'm not talking about entering a master's program, or a PhD program, or even a college level program. I'm talking about before you get started on that path, how do they? Uh, you know, uh, expect to get uh, some guidance that has relevance to where they are in their lives. And I, I'll just give one personal example. I had a chance to, uh, for a former job, I had a chance to go to a middle school um, academy where they were teaching aviation-centric topics like uh, aer aer aerospace, uh, sorry, physical laws, uh, then uh, chemical laws and its application to uh, air, air, aircraft and then ultimately rocket uh, motors. And the kids at grade four and five, they were uh, given the chance to design their own you know, rocket uh, um, um, uh, project. But the questions that they asked on day one of the program versus the questions that they asked on day five of the program were vastly different. They actually were able to absorb because they had everything laid out for them. It was a curriculum that was designed to uh, teach something in about four or five days. But when they asked the question at day five, the question was not that what to do, how to do it, where to do it, and so on and so forth. They were asking like, what can we do after we leave the school? The kids were already, um, at the time uh, they're uh, you know, maturing fast enough, they're actually asking the question, when we go home, can we, you know, learn something more. So the interest was peaked, but I happen to understand that when they went to the schools, they wouldn't get that kind of support that they would get in that specialized academic you know, short program. So the, the reaction I got from surveying pretty much a lot of the faculty around uh, in that particular program was that the, the traditional education system, which in the United States, is pretty much uh, governed by standards of learning. That does not account really for any deviation from those standards of learning to the point 
you may have half a day at a particular academy, you may have a week at a particular academy, but it's not really a chance to break off into a different career. But if you stick to the standards of learning, then you would ultimately follow the regular path, go to uh, a particular juncture, junction point like your senior year and make a decision as to which particular path you're going to be chosen. Space industry itself has a big disadvantage right here. Because space industry is the culmination, it requires the amalgamation of a lot of different subordinate topics. I feel that the, the, uh, ad, the advantages of working in the space industry and the need of the space industry to take uh, you know, account of all of the subordinate topics is lost in the noise of like, you have to learn this, 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 you have to learn this before you can become uh, uh, in a very valuable manner. This is my opinion, but I'm finding that it's a layers of onion problem. The more layers of the onion that you peel, the more onion there is, uh, uh, ultimately. And can we, can we come to some kind of a consensus in a short manner as to whether this is the right way to uh, approach the problem of how do we get more uh, persons interested into working in the space industry and affecting policy that will affect the space program, the outcome of the space program, or should we just simply say, let's stay within the system uh, and uh, uh, you know work within it, or should we just take a branch out and say that you know if you want to attract more people to the space system, have a parallel track that just deals with space as a separate topic from uh, say middle childhood to uh, young adulthood. So this it is a very um, broad topic, but it's a very uh, important topic to start a thread on because I don't think anybody, at least here in this conference, is satisfied with the way things are. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be coming up here and you know discussing about like you know what can we do? We we can't do it in a traditional sense. But I just like to open up the floor and get some input. Um, my uh, introduction is that I'm a uh, research assistant with Dr. Michael Kedar of uh, George Washington University. I have not started at the university, but I've already started collaborating um, with him in, on, in the field of micropropulsion. I have a master's of science in space studies. Um, I was selected as an outstanding graduate student for American Ministry University uh, in the space studies program. My research interest is um, uh, broadband deep space communication between uh, interplanetary you know, bodies. And uh, my own background is not space sciences or aerospace engineering, it's mostly computer science, information technology, information communication technology, and a career in fixed satellite services. And I do apologize for the fact that I think we do not have air conditioning in this room. I think they're, they're actually, you know, probably not functional at this point. Right, so yesterday I think was a bit more comfortable in the rooms, I would think. But I'll... I'll Right, so uh, if we can leave the doors open, would that help at all? Probably. Or we're okay? Oh, we're yeah, why don't we do that? Yeah, because it might actually. But uh, really, I've, I've said what I wanted to say, but I just like to get some ideas. Oh, please do. Oh. <laughs> How many? That's not terribly distracting. I'm sorry. Can you bring me some white and black ones? <laughs> Are you going to get certain colors? <laughs> but may we ask, what, I mean, what are you going to be doing or? Okay, there you go. <laughs> You'll see if it works out. If not, I'll tell you about something else. I, I had a short discussion <laughs> with uh, our guest here. I had a short discussion with our guest here early on, and I was lamenting the fact, it's my personal opinion, that if I asked a professor who was very well known in the field of uh, space sciences or space system engineering, and I did, and I have this habit of calling up professors and actually asking them, even though I don't know them, and just make cold calls like, hello, professor, doctor, whatever. Typically, the reaction in, in about three of the four calls that I make is like, no, I won't talk to you, you don't know what you're talking about. This is the reaction that I get from the professors who are very well known in their fields, that they don't have time to talk to you know, uh, you know, young researchers. Right, you know, who, who imagine have, talking to a high school kid then. Right, right, and it, or imagine getting, from the, from the point of view that a high school kid is trying to get right. some knowledge, yeah. some mentorship. There are mentor programs, there are guidance programs, there are you know outreach programs, there are uh, cross uh, cross uh, education programs, there are advanced programs, there are placement programs. For example, I was just interviewed by 
uh, an, a local academy which was, shall not be named, but they interviewed me directly, like, would you like to teach at our academy? So I'm a you know, graduate student and all that and everything. And they offered me a substitute teacher position, everything, and I said, well, I'd like to teach this, 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 you know, I just kept on going. And they said, no, we can't let you teach any of that. We have a certain syllabus, we have a certain guideline, and we won't let you teach anything out of the box. Now, children are not dumb, as we probably all know, but if they're excited about things, they'll find out ways to actually, you know, teach the teacher, if you will, if they are just allowed. But when they're given a 15-year-old syllabus and pencil and paper, and this is all that's been approved, you know, what's the whole point of, you know, spending half a day at school and going there and being, you know, taught? So you're being restricted in what you can teach because of this these uh, standards. But that's just a, a highly technical academy. It's a school within a school concept. It's in Virginia, and uh, it actually buses in students uh, for half a day and gives them, you know, teaching. And it's a one or two credit course on aerospace sciences. But whatever they're teaching has been already pre-approved. There's no new content there. So I was just feeling a bit frustrated that there's no point in getting involved. I but don't I understand you. why um, yes. they don't look at learning as um, something that is constantly evolving. They, they figure, okay, we've got a curriculum, and now this is it. And they only look at updating it like on inter, you know, large intervals of years of like, okay, now this is way outdated, we need to redo it. But it shouldn't it be something that evolves constantly? And um, uh, can I uh, just request, uh, perhaps as an organizer for this session, uh, to, uh, for, uh, uh, if I could just ask your uh, just name as to record, and then I'll just you know type it up as a you know kind of like meeting minutes that we have this discussion. And it's just Jen. Uh, right. Sheer. S C H E E R. S C H E E R. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. And uh, please go ahead. I'm sorry I interrupted. No, that's that was basically it. I'm just saying that it's it's not something that's you figure out your curriculum and then you're done. It's something that needs to be a living, breathing but thing and change. most standards of learning are kind of constant for the five years or ten years that right. they're in control. Right, and I, I think that that's bad because we learn so much constantly that that should be able to evolve with what you learn. Is that something that others uh, you know, have an opinion on? Uh, uh, well, certainly you can, you can change the curricula, but there are some basics that you need to fulfill. So. The problem is that who decides what to teach? I think it's good that if they, for example, if they um, say, okay, let's do some curricular uh, space. And, and can we just uh, know your uh, name, please? Bruno. Bruno? Yes. Okay, great. B A U N O. Yeah. So if they, if, they, if they have the idea, the great idea to teach some of the space exploration issues or some curriculum on that, it's good that someone says, okay, the minimum should be done is this, this and this and then some. I would like to uh, offer a differing viewpoint to this because I've had a chance to grow up in a museum because my dad was a museologist and archaeologist, so I literally grew up in a museum. Uh, my, my entire family is full of historians and all that, and as I've grown up with 20,000 books in my house, I've read some of them. But that's not what I'm uh, going to focus on. I'm just saying that the knowledge every generation accumulates during their schooling. Like uh, uh, in my culture, in my original ethnic background, we have uh, you know, kindergarten school, uh, regular school, we have uh, secondary school, we have higher secondary school, we see one of your high school here in the US. And every generation learns a lot more than the previous generation. I mean, what we were learning in, in college is now being taught in say grade uh, nine or 10, um, you know, but uh, the next generation will learn that amount of material perhaps in earlier, uh, uh, you know, great. I'm just asking that if we continue to teach the basics, are we increasing the amount of topics that we consider to be basic, or are we just staying constant? As I see most of the syllabuses, and I've done some studying on various states standard learning, they're pretty much the same basic all the way to say grade eight. I mean, application of basic principles in a leapfrog uh, syllabus in a leapfrogging syllabus mode where you basically teach the applications first and then you say that okay you want to to the basics I mean you're if, if, if children or youth are being taught fresh you know they have no prior experience and they're just simply uh, taught okay this is what you have to learn if they're taught basic they learn the basic 
But if they're taught advanced topics, they'll end up learning advanced topics. Yeah, I but basics are common to more theory, to more other skills. So if you teach them basics about, I don't know, say, we can go towards engineering, we can go towards literature, we can go towards biology, we can go towards many things. Okay. If you can advance, you are predefining which direction are we going to take. Do you think, does anybody have an opinion on whether basic education um, should remain as basic as it is clean, cut and dry, that this is all you have to learn and then you make a decision at la later years, or do you simply just say, take an advanced topic, complicated topic, such as uh, you know, de uh, design uh, a mission around a set of principles, and then simply let them absorb you know, the principles directly and just think creatively. So it's called problem-based learning. Yeah. So, yeah, and a lot of people, a lot of schools and, and teachers do that already. I'm, I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No, no, go ahead, please, Um, My name is Aaliyah, A-L-E-Y-A. A-L-E-Y-A. -E right. Um, I, I don't know what your experience is with that school or with other schools, but um, I, th I think it comes down to the classroom and the teachers because once that door shuts, I mean... My personal experience has been, uh, you know, in various uh, countries, various, uh, you know, uh, cultures uh, that I've been posted in and worked in, and one of them was a village out in, in northeastern Bangladesh, uh, you know, far away from civilization, literally, in the middle of the boondocks on hill, hill tracks. But I set up a satellite earth station, so we were connected, so otherwise the whole community was not connected. But then what happened was that the school that actually was set up to educate the, the, uh, the school children of a certain age in a village was sponsored by a foundation which only focused on leapfrogging education practice. So they actually taught at, I think, year six or year five of the child's age, uh, topics like microprocessors, motherboards, computers, software, Java, what have you. They just basically skipped the whole formal education because they didn't have a correct school system there. They just wanted to teach it. But within two years after getting that initial, you know, high technology training, the students were able to program directly and sell their programming services to overseas patrons. So that is an interesting example of a completely uh, uh, fresh approach to teaching. That if you're going to be teaching somebody something, I'm not really sure if that would fly here, though, because right, we're and so that, concerned and with I, and giving I admit that the whole, whole concept teach. of leapfrogging might be based on you know whatever each region is doing. But mm -hmm. if you don't leapfrog or if you don't advance the syllabus enough to consider a complete picture, which is what what, what I'm going to raise as a topic, if the if you, when you were in school, if all, you collectively were all in school, when you were in grade eight, and you had a picture of what you could do, could, could uh, get involved in, would your choices of education have been a bit different? Oh, I would have been an engineer, hands down, if I'd have known what I know now about, you know, the, the aerospace. I mean, do you need the details to make that decision, or I, you just yeah, need somebody I, to tell you? I would have needed more details though. Like I, I would have needed to see the clean rooms and I would have needed to... Do you need more detail or, do you or did you just need the exposure and you didn't get it? I'm not sure. Because I'm not sure. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Justin Kubler and right. I work in the ISS National Lab Office and a very big part of what we do is uh, fostering uh, educational programs for the uh, International Space Station program. And I, I've also volunteered with uh, initiatives like the United Space School and the International Space Settlement Design Competition. And in all of those programs, we don't expect the students to get every, every, every single last detail, uh, especially in uh, the United Space School and the International Space Settlement Design Competition. It's more about getting them to start thinking about all of the things that they would have to consider. For example, the United Space School students, they were uh, put into teams of four to design uh, essentially a, a manned expedition to Mars. And then this year in the International Space Element Design Competition, they had to design an actual living and working city on Mars. And think about all the various aspects that would go into that, not only the engineering and architecture, but also uh, life support systems 
how do you actually design and master plan a community so that you can have large amounts of people living in what is effectively an enclosed space for a long period how of time. How old were your candidates in that program? In the International Space Center Design level, Competition, those were uh, high school aged kids and uh, with uh, the United Space School, uh, uh, about, uh, about, the, about the same age, but there were like a couple of kids that were just out of middle school and about the middle same school. Time. So, so could we? I mean, is it fair to say they were between ages of say fourteen or onwards to eighteen? Yeah, I'd say between fourteen and eighteen. And how long of an exposure did they actually have for the program to have an effect? The United Space School kids were there for two weeks, and the uh, ISSVC kids are there for about four days. Four days and four days is enough to basically spark their interest. Well, and also the, the kids that were there for the the actual top level competition, they had all uh, uh, competed at uh, uh, regional and national levels to uh, gain to, entrance into the to program. To gain entrance into the program, right? So they they did have some uh, background in, introduction to the topics before and they got there. May I ask who were the motivators or the actual, you know? Um, I guess I'm, I'm not aware of the word, but who's, who gave them the first spark at, the, at their own individual levels that, you know, um, uh, hey, you know, would you, you seem bright, you, you can do things, I mean, you wanna apply? It, I mean, it, it largely seems to be uh, teachers and, and educators that essentially are either familiar with or know the people that, that put the programs on and uh, help do the recruiting. In the educational programs that that I've worked on at NASA, uh, it's it's very it's very much the same way. For example, we had uh, two uh, science teachers come into JSC on an Endeavor fellowship for two weeks, and essentially what they did is they sat down for two weeks, cataloged all of the science content that we had on the ISS Science website, and then broke it down into categories based on what experiments and what information we had available was appropriate to what grade levels, and they designed a competition uh, for various grade levels to uh, essentially write summaries of those, exper of those experiments at the reading level of, of their different grades. So they did it for uh, essentially the various levels of K through 12. They did elementary, middle, and, and high school and essentially had varying levels of, of standards for uh, what level of fidelity they would expect uh, the students to write to, what topics they should I'm very to. amazed and by they, And they tied it back to the National Science Literacy Education Standards. I'm very amazed by this information. Um, I, I admit that I didn't know that much detail. Um, I had only exposure in, in mentoring uh, you know, a few nephews uh, here and there that they should try to do it. But when they went to their schools in Texas, Kind of like the reaction was that no, we don't get involved, or no, we don't know what to do, or whatever. Maybe it's just because the school district that they were in, but or maybe the instructor. But if we could fix that issue, or if we could try to influence educational policy across the board to fix that issue, that we shouldn't have these gaps. That everybody should be aware that there is, you know, a broader, uh, you know, opportunity in the space industry. But that's not just in the space industry. I think that's everywhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. trying to just say, hey, space has an issue with this. I think that's, in general, there's no way to take and catalog the millions of individual education opportunities that are out there, which some of them are very localized. Like, this is a, a thing for, you know, I'm in Florida, and we have opportunities that are for Florida schools to go and do something. And then there are times when they'll say, well, we'll open it up to a, a broader regional opportunity or national opportunity, but not international or international but for only certain countries. You know, like there's, to be able to put together a database that with all of the opportunities, with all of the constraints that they have on them, appropriate to all of the different age levels, would be a massive undertaking. Um, yeah. I'm actually uh, not going to, uh, uh, you know, um, suggest that ever. Uh, <laughs> uh, writing databases, uh, you know, will actually solve anything, but what, what I did, um, in a, and I showed this effectively in a particular program, was to create a learning resource navigator myself uh, for a particular program where I basically made it kind of a tree, an inverse tree. 
um, of, of graphics, but okay, if you are here today and you want to go to this particular, you know, job description or, um, um, you know, you want to work in this area, you have to follow this kind of path in generic steps. Example, um, a one public example of such a tree is the uh, federal jobs website, which actually has a particular page that says that if you have these disciplines, you can work in these areas. If you don't have these disciplines, then you can't work in these areas, according to their suggestion. It's not a hard and fast rule. It's the first attempt that when a, uh, uh, a youth uh, graduating from high school is going into college, they have the first year general studies, and then second year some specialization, third year they have to select a major, and then to conclude by the fourth year. They have a limited amount of time in order to just make a decision as to which one way they want to go. Now they can choose their path, and they can also change their path, but if they don't know where they're going to be uh, able to work, how will they choose their career? This is the Fed Jobs uh, you know, explanation. But I'm, I'm asking if there is any potential of uh, a next generation of educators to use a tool, and this could be a tool, plug in whatever the interest of the student is, and then uh, you know, suggest the different uh, uh, interesting uh, career possibilities related to the space industry and vice versa. And you I, want the I educator to be doing this, not the student themselves? Of course, the, uh, the program would be available you know, ultimately on a web-based, uh, web-enabled platform. So the students, if they were motivated to you know, go into that or, and I'm going to make an interesting uh, connection to the edutainment industry, video games have the ability now to be highly interactive. Mm -hmm. And video games often have the ability to be cross-linked to you know, external websites. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they're completely web-based. Well, web-based is a technology, but you could actually have playing uh, Grand Theft Auto get a, you know, a display board or an ATM machine that you have to interact with, which can be a real-world analog of the... Uh, yeah. you know. Well, like in games now, they... Uh, I guess you might said in urban settings, they actually have in-game billboards yeah, they do in game right, right, but that's just for revenue generation. Right. But you could actually you have an educational spend. Like yeah, that. right. Or yeah, and also good. They, yeah. Well, in in schools, they do career counseling in sixth grade. In, in right, schools. but the career and, and there and there are things that they do like they have games and websites where you can go through and like check right. your interest. And in fact, and NASA has uh, you know started to explore uh, that quite a bit. But we're not. And there, about there's even that that. What do you want to be, or what is? Is there a place in space for you, or um, what that's am I at the museum. at the national, um, the national uh, the Air and Space Museum? Right, but that's a, a, that's yeah. a part of the museum, you know, we, we, where you're assuming that the audience is going to be right there at the museum. But that same no, program could be used. It could just be oh, put. Okay. It could be put yeah. online and do this exactly the same thing as they do there on the touch screen. So you want to? You're, you're suggesting that this program we could, we could expand the reach of that sure. kind of program. If, if there is a possibility of expanding that reach, how deep do you want to actually take it? Because there's another layer to this. Once a uh, possibility is uh, explained to a you know, youth or teenager or young adult, they have to have, say, a guidance from a particular mentor in order to sharpen their focus. Is, is that something that uh, could be formed, and I'm going to use the word apprentice here, because this is actually appropriate, that could be, and I noticed that uh, the NASA uh, program for uh, creating apprenticeships and apprentices are available in certain of the centers. Could we, could we encourage uh, an apprenticeship program where they're actually choosing to ally themselves to a particular uh, 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 faculty at a particular college and university so that they can begin their path to whatever specialization. Is this something that could be considered? Just open thoughts. If not, then it's not going to happen. It's not a big deal. Well, when I was in high school, uh, Johnson Space Center and some of the other centers actually had a program kind of like that. It was the uh, Summer High School Apprenticeship Research Program. Apprenticeship Research yes. itself? And so my, after my junior year and after my senior year of high school, uh, I went to JSC for the summer and I did uh, two tours in the, in the Mission Operations Directorate. And I was doing real work while I was there. My first summer I was doing orbital debris analysis for MOD. And then the second summer I was working with the program management folks 
in the space vehicle mock-up facility, and I did a loading a loading study for uh, the training usage of the of the entire facility. Oh, be sure that I'm jealous, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that's something that I never had the opportunity to consider. And you know, they, and then uh, essentially that that type and. Well, the, fir the first summer was SHARP, sorry, I, I, I misstated that. The first summer was the SHARP program, and then if you did the SHARP program, they had something available at the time called the pre twelve program, because they didn't want to lose the interest of SHARP students during the transition from high school to college, and then becoming an actual engineering co-op. So I got into the pre twelve program, and I did that for two summers. And the first summer was uh, where I was doing uh, the loading study, and then the second summer, I was an intern in Franklin Chain Diaz's plasma rocket lab. Sweet. Wow. Nice. But then, but then my, uh, but then I kind of went off the rails because uh, my uh, undergraduate uh, coordinator told me that I was being selfish in going for a co-op slot because I'd already had three tours at NASA and wouldn't sign off on the paperwork for me to become a full-fledged co-op even though I had a spot well. waiting for me. And because I was what? never a co and because but because I was never officially a co-op, I can't even get in for an interview at NASA. I, I've had oh. to work as a contractor. Well, and that I think highlights another, you know, like the NASA programs are designed to funnel you straight into NASA. It's not it's not hey you can come in and do it for a semester and then leave. Yeah. Because I, I wanted to get into those programs and it was like well sorry our co-op programs are already filled up by the people who are in the high school program. Who were people that came from NASA education or explorer well, schools? How did you find out about those programs? Like, like unless your school district is yeah, yeah is exactly. like keyed in, then you. Then if I wasn't doing it in kindergarten, I wasn't going to get into it in well, college. I, I who knows just, what the, that they want to do that yeah. when they're in kindergarten? I, I, mean, I found well, out. I did. Parents, parents sending the kids it, to yeah. do it. Right. I mean, have yeah. interwebs back then. The tunes yeah. didn't reach to Georgia. So. <laughs> yeah. I found out and about the, the Sharp program because. Uh, uh, one of the guys that uh, my dad knew worked at SGI on their modeling and simulation contract, right. and he was going to bring me in as an intern for uh, SGI. SGI Silicon Graphics? Yeah, Silicon yeah. Graphics. Yeah. But they said I was too young to be an intern for the company, so he pointed me at Am the amazing, show. Amazing stories. I hope this is being at least uh, you know, cataloged. You know, <laughs> respect. Please go ahead. Um, What's your uh, name, please? Tiffany Titus. Okay, right, Tiffany. Um, I have to say that, I mean, I didn't live anywhere near a NASA center unless you consider NASA Glenn close. But I lived in, I grew up in Michigan, basically in farm country. Okay. And I think I got lucky. I was always interested in space, growing up on a farm, you know, looking up and seeing the night sky and everything. But the high school I went to, students didn't care. They didn't, I mean, I was, I was required to take two science classes the entire four years I was in high school. Oh. But, um, Luckily, there was a program in our county called the Battle Creek Bass Science Center where they selected a certain percentage from um, groups of schools in the area to go there and it focused on advanced college prep. So like, I got to take physics as a freshman in high school, like calculus-based physics then, which I would never have had the chance if I stayed in my home school. And from that, I obviously got a lot more exposed. I knew that I wanted to go into aerospace engineering because that was what I was passionate about. But I also had a huge interest in astronomy, and I went to a summer astrophysics camp in California, which I won a national award for, which I never had I been stuck in Pittsville, USA, going to school, I probably wouldn't have had the chances that would I you, had. Would you have, I mean, based on your life experiences to date, would you have a suggestion for, uh, you know, a, a program that we as the community, I mean, this is a general uh, statement right now. Just like yesterday, I proposed a civilian astronaut corps, which is actually an old idea that I just basically said that, look, it's going to be taken in a refreshed mode. But it is a legitimate you know, a demand by a lot of the science community that why should everybody have to be a coronal major, you know, whatever, to get into space? I mean, you know, yeah. they would put it in there that we can't do this. And why should we be cut off at a certain age that we can't go to space? I mean, if I'm smart enough, I, I, and I earn my way, I should be able to go to space and do whatever work. But um, similar to that, if the internet is now the lingua franca of all the communication around the whole world, we are really competing against everybody else's cousins, brothers, sisters. And, and I'd like to just point out that my claim to fame lies fundamentally on the fact that in 1993, on November 11th, I connected Bangladesh to the internet myself. If I hadn't done it, I would have been much more happier. <laughs> so everything is my fault. 
whether people can do email, can yell at email, write capital letters, or whether they do you know whatever adult stuff, or whether they just or my kids call me on Skype and everything. I say, Dad, what are you doing? You know, or my ten-year-old complains that the birthday cake we got her today, which is she's over there, is not to our liking because it's green colored and whatever. Mm -hmm. These are all things that happen because we started early on in trying to connect things, but. If the world is connected, we are fighting against them right now for resources, for skill sets and everything. But here in the US, internet is slowly getting back to speed and we're doing higher speed. Is there anything we can do from perhaps your, your, your background to give the next generation of students directly an opportunity to get more knowledge right now that they wouldn't have? I'm not talking about learning physics online or I'm not talking about something that's out of their league. But if they had a nice little website, which they have websites, they're all over the place. We just need links to that website. Yeah. We just need like banners like, you know, hey, know about your potential, one work in the space industry, I don't know, some crappy advertising. I think they need more mentors, uh, people right. that are inside the industry that will go around and, and tell kids what it's really like, because that's what they really want to know. So, so in, yeah. instead of going physically, could we go virtually? Maybe. Probably. Like Max Headroom in the 21st century? Well, a lot of that is kind of what we do on Twitter. We have um, some younger kids that are really interested in space and they have questions and we tell them, oh yeah, you know, this, sometimes I'll post a picture of a test set up or something and people will be like, oh, that's kind of like what we're doing in my high school electronics class. And I'm like, it's probably exactly like what you're doing. <laughs> um, but, but I'd like to, I'd like to say, um, uh, uh, Jen, is it? Yes. Uh, but Justin's I mean, I, I, I'm from a television production background. I mean, okay, I mean, alter ego, television production, but I just saw him just animatedly talk, you know. And I was just wondering, when I saw you use your iPad very effective, uh, that's an iPad, isn't it? Yeah. It right, was. it's very effective, like very nice visual graphics, you know, nice format for showing. And I noticed that you got it down that, you know, you, you know how to present the, you know, I, I, iPad content, 3G connected and all that. But I'm just <laughs> saying that, if I could have just shot his video right now and edited it and put it, you know, online, you know, as part of something that people are reading, and suddenly they click on it, like here's an interview of somebody who actually did something, that is really exciting to me because it actually brings them closer to me. Though I might not have a chance to go and visit, you know, uh, whatever town and city. I'm just well, wondering. yeah, but the mentorship, like you're saying, I mean, we can still connect with people on a one-to-one a -one level. Right through tools like Twitter and Facebook and um, I mean you can have other websites that are set up just for mentoring. I just I think that a lot of times young people want to talk to the actual people that are in those oh, jobs. I mean, on a one-to-one so, -one basis? Yeah, and ask them questions. Like, so maybe what we is, need to do something where we can essentially set up like uh, essentially like maybe like telepresence centers at the different NASA centers where that are specifically connected to uh, educational programs around the country to give there's, people the ability to interact without having to travel. There's already the distance learning network and there's the Skype Sciences. DLN is the distance learning network. Yeah, I, the I know trouble with DLN, that stuff, Ali, is that nobody about, knows about it. I know, <laughs> which is, I think what he's talking about is we're all sharing all of these things and, and nobody knew. Right. right. We, we, have a, we have a difference between the, the last row and the last row minus one, <laughs> you know, already. But well, I know I'd like to just DLN, but I'm talking about like something in real time. Yeah, that's all real time. Uh, DLN, all they do is video conferencing. And so they do two ways. So the people on the one end see the classroom that they're talking to. Okay, because uh, at JSC, we, a lot of us have the impression that DLN was uh, online but not real time. No, they, it, it shouldn't be. If I don't know how they do it at your center, but at Goddard and Kennedy and um, JPL, they, it's Kennedy all, does it? Yeah, Kennedy is the big one. Yeah, so right. Actually, we're the good one. Okay. Kennedy are, we, the good one. are we talking about the same NASA across the whole place or six different NASAs? There is That's part of the problem is that and it's not all NASA. NASA. You know, Northrop Grumman is downstairs trying to recruit engineers by buying out a coffee. They're, they're down here. <laughs> yeah, and see, can, like, I, can I sign up? Like, well, yeah, and you can't. And they're saying, like, we have thousands of engineering positions that are available, yeah. and we've got right. thousands of people looking for it. it it's, I think, our biggest oh, problem. And here's one right here. Part of it is human resources. 
Oh when yeah, they don't. They, they don't want to. They want to read. They don't want to read the yeah. CVs at all. They just want to. They, they have their own thing, yeah. and then I talk to people on the inside to see. <coughs> managers have seen my resume, but they have to wait for human resources. And well, they, they go to online. It's just crap. They they follow keywords. They follow. Yeah, keywords. Um, well, even with that though, even uh, with that. But I think that's the same with the education yeah. program. Yeah. Is that if there's not a human resources connection to get a student into a program, I knew about all these education programs, but I had no like connection to get in or anybody to help me fill out a form and when I didn't understand what it said it was like I don't even know if I can fill out the application correctly there's no one-to-one -one availability it doesn't have to be that we come and set up a DLN network at the school but at least have somebody available like that I can call and talk to that will talk back to me it's set up to exclude a lot of people it, it is and it takes a lot of resources to make things like that open and available and for the communication well, to way to there is there is a great advantage in discussing this right now in the day and age of uh, Twitter communications and all that. I mean, if, I'm just going to not say Twitter itself <laughs> being the solution. Right. But yeah. if if a couple of us could form a seed group, which would actually have to expand, much like what I saw today, the millions of people coming to visit Land Bank. Oh I mean, that is a good <laughs> example in you know that group organization. I think Obama did basically had sort of history lesson. You know, taught a lesson to all Americans do it. They did it correctly. I'm just pointing out to take away from this session, uh, you know, leading forwards. If you have the ability to initiate a program to connect mentors or to create a group of mentors or to reach out and say, "Would you like to be a mentor to this region or whatever?" Please do consider it. But Sorry. if I may uh, just uh, point out. Even within the organization called Na NASA, which is a mega organization called NASA, there needs to be a bit of uh, discussion at the uh, senior leadership. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, but no, no, you're, you're talking about NASA and all that. that that's wonderful. Let, yeah. let them get some skin in the game. Beautiful. Right. What about the rest of us that are outside looking into all of this? How do we go ahead and cultivate the, you know, a child's uh, development? What development? Um, Please, uh, I'm not going to wait on this. They do it. We're, we're no, neither am I. And yeah. this is what I'm getting we're, 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 I'm the next session, actually. Yeah, we're getting kicked out. Really? I thought I had four minutes. No, no. I, I, I finished at 10.45. Okay. Okay. Right. I mean, you can go a little bit longer. That's fine. All right. I, at 11, I'm going to start complaining. So, okay. fine. Please do, uh, you know, join us. Yes. Sure, All right. Um, I mean, real quick, my uh, I have uh, uh, four, uh, four nephews. I mean, uh, three nephews and one niece. And I started flying these, you know, the little Estes rockets with them. And all of a sudden, now the 11-year-old wants to know how high they went. So I am, I am helping, right? And so I'm helping him go ahead, and I'm giving him the formula and how to calculate altitude on these things. I and mean, he doesn't know the, you know, the, the trigonometry of the whole thing thing yet, but he's he's getting exposure to it now. And you know, here he is, 11 years old, and doing some rudimentary trig to learn how, how high these things went. Um, I mean, these are the things that maybe you know anybody in this room can do. You don't necessarily have to. I'm not discounting NASA. NASA indeed has to do something, but the rest of us can also get involved on that kind of level. Everybody's talking about being a mentor. Well, it starts with you. If you have an interest and yeah. you're trying to spark an interest. And you have a you have you, you have a young person over there that you want to see. Oh, maybe they might enjoy doing this stuff. I mean, now he's he's 11 years old and he's designing his own rockets and he's launching it. I, I think I should clarify that uh, I am um, also uh, you know um, very seriously encouraging you know uh, my family or my family friends to be mentors to their kids for whatever they want to do. But as a ham radio operator myself, member of AMSAT. Um, basically, um, I'm well advanced in a capacity to induct anybody who wants to be part of a space program, a real mm -hmm. space program, you know, given the fact that those guys, our grandparents or you know, our fathers have, you know, pretty much been um, involved in designing spacecraft and launching them on their own, uh, you know, uh, since the 1960s. So I'm uh, available for mentorship if somebody wants to be, like, I want to design a spacecraft, like, right now, now, now. Right. Yeah. They need to get a ham radio license, or they need to work with somebody who has a ham radio license. Right. But ultimately, it's good. I, I don't have to go to NASA to, to do it. And but that knowledge of that AMSAT is available is like NASA's knowledge. I mean, it's, it, the exposure isn't there. Not many people know about 
that Amtep actually has a, a whole uh, you know history of global space program to actually build it. Not many people know that because it's hidden under the uh, category of are you a ham radio operator. It's not for everybody. So perhaps uh, I'd just like to uh, perhaps uh, conclude with to stay within the time limit that if any of you have uh, the time to create a paragraph or two as suggestion that we could then post to the wiki for the for the unconference and actually call us our ideas, your ideas, your own ideas that I suggest, you know, dot dot dot, that we undertake these action items, then perhaps we can, you know, try to get a, you know a policy note to some organization for consideration and discussion at the leadership level. Because otherwise we will be just talking into the wind and I don't want to do that right. anymore. So um, on behalf of uh, the uh, um, George Washington University, um, a mechanical and aerospace engineering department, which will basically um, benefit from this knowledge because I've been asked very recently to look at why are there not any more, why are there a, a, a fewer number of students wanting to join the aerospace engineering department at the university here specifically. And I had to tell them that because your programs aren't very interesting. <laughs> It might also be that the job prospects aren't very great. Well, that's, or people that's don't think they are. That was the thing with Northrop. They're like, go. what yeah. are you talking about? There's thousands of, in, uh, of jobs. And they're like, yeah. we're hiring everybody, and we can't get people to apply. But yet, okay. Tiffany yeah. has, well, has yeah. applied. Well, yeah. Maybe because we talk together, okay? Well, I would say, yeah, we needed to go to them and say, everybody who's applied to Northrop Grumman, raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. But uh, uh, I think uh, um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm glad that we got this chance to discuss, and I would recommend we continue this discussion over the next you know time before the next space up if necessary, but also in the background as we go back to your you know kind of like party. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just to let everybody know that the dirty up and hippie session is going to be as we move ahead to now. So if you want to see it, stick around. Right. If you're not going to get started, I don't dirty up and hippie in space. I don't need any. <laughs> You've got a pretty interesting, uh, you know, tech and background in project work. So are you, uh, uh, your oh, focus on tech? Oh, sweet. Yeah. My favorite spacecraft ever. Uh, oh, okay. One of those creepy SAIC, we get into everything. <laughs> they own the world. They do. They're a secret organization, but I'm not allowed to talk about that. There were more and more of these world records. Yeah, they're, uh, uh, do they well, they're orchestrating the UN treaty so that they have complete legal control. Oh, that's not good. What are you going to be uh, um, actually um, discussing in terms of like uh, your topic? We're tracking liberal activists. Oh. Yeah. Um, I made it. How to what entails, what entails progressive, liberal, leftist, democratic space policy, and how do you attract the, that crowd? I assume that you came through Metro today? No, I did not. Uh, oh. Uh, I was, I, I knew. Today I was the odd man out, specifically in a carriage full of, uh, if I may just uh, make a, a snappy comment, uh, full of uh, non dark skinned people. I, I noticed, right. I noticed that while I was driving down the road. That is interesting. But the whole tea party seems to be very... I mean, they just looked at me like, very 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 and because we were all crowded together. Yeah. Just, yeah. We were all crowded together. Like They said, where are you going? Like you know, just, They had to ask because everybody was with their uh, grandmother, grandparents, uh, kids, uh, kids in tram, baby, whatever. And like, I was like, okay, well, excuse me, but... <laughs> and are you going to the Glenn Beck party to do? You know, today? I'm like, in, in Southern Brawl, too. You going to that Glenn Beck Tea Party rally? Whatever. <laughs> I had to no. say that no, I'm going to a conference. Like, okay, what do you do? You know, like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to university. What, you know, what do you do? You know, okay. The more inquisitive question. So, which I think is fine, but yeah. Yeah, the Sharks program doesn't even exist anymore, as far as I know. They they discontinued the high school program, and I think that's one thing that gets it is. Once somebody's been in the program and can go out and say, hey, I did this great program when I was a student, you should look it up. And they look it up and say, it doesn't exist. Oh, it's the short term oh. program, yeah. Okay.